In case anyone's wondering how Chris is doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Franz. No, I'm, I'm pitiful. Um, so I, I, I want to start off and jump into this message and, and read something to you guys. Um, and uh, when it pops up here on the screen, I'm, I'm going to read it to you. And I'm pretty much going to jump into this thing. Then I'm going to go back and I'm going to explain to you uh, what, it is that, um, what it is that we're talking about today. So let's take a look at this. He was lying in un relieved misery for months. He had open sores all over his body. And during this time, he bore the grief of seven dead sons and three dead daughters. And it goes on to say, all of his wealth had vanished in one afternoon. He had become repulsive to his wife. Some of us can identify with that. Loathsome to his brothers. And even little children despised him as he lay on the ash heap outside of town. Okay, so the question is, is who am I? Okay, got, got another one for you. It's eager beavers there. So here we have a man of many labors, many imprisonments, beaten times without number and often in danger of death. Five times he received 39 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods and one time he was stoned. Three times he was shipwrecked, drifted in the ocean for a night and a day. And on every journey, he was always exposed to the danger from rivers, bandits, his own people, and the people that he was called to love. So he experienced danger in the city, danger in the wilderness and on the sea, and among people claiming to be Christians. He was constantly, constantly in labor and hardship, often unable to sleep in hunger and in thirst, often driven to fasting because there was no food and cold and in exposure without the right clothes. Now those are just the external things because there was also the daily inescapable pressure of his concern for others. So who am I? Yeah, so this morning we're talking about Job and Paul. Now, God put this message on my heart for you guys because there are some things that were happening here in the, in the church, happening with the, the people and the members of this church. Things that just kept coming up and coming up and coming up and they were coming up through our, our prayer groups and through our chats and, and people were just really struggling with some things and, and God started to, to work on my, my heart and he started to speak to me and started kind of to reveal this burden to me and, I, and as I started to unpack it, I just, I just wanted you guys to know that, that if you've reached out, if you've expressed that something has been hard and you've been in a season of struggle or that you're up against something really difficult right now, I just want you to know that I, I've heard your desperation. And, and because I've heard your desperation, I, I wanted to just take some time here and, and look into you know, what God would have you to say or what God would have me to say to you. You know, I, I hear that, that some of you are, are struggling with with death in the family, with, with bills, with debt, with just kind of these like, what seems like these hopeless situations. And, and in praying for you guys, in hearing your desperation, I found that, you know what, I'm, I was drawn very much so to the stories of Job and the stories of Paul on, on your behalf. That's where Job and Paul came from. And so what, what I want you to know above anything and everything else, and I believe that, that this is for, for someone here to hear this, now, th- this goes out to everybody, whether you're a regular member here at South Point Church or whether this is your first Sunday ever because you're here for baby dedication. You know what? You don't even have to believe in Jesus or understand Jesus or understand Christianity or the church, but, but this, is, this is a statement that's for you. And I wrestled with this for a long time. And, and you need to hear it. And, and, and it's this, that no matter, and I, w- I want you to read it and hear me say it, no matter who you are, where you are, or what you believe. Today, I'm here to show you that God has heard you. See, you, you, you've, you've got something in your heart that you've expressed a cry to God for. Or, or if you don't believe in God, you've got something in your heart that you've expressed a cry for help for. Or maybe you feel like you're in a hopeless situation and you've not expressed a cry to somebody, but you feel that cry deep down in your heart. See, I I know that amongst our members that this is happening. It's happening so much so that I had to stop a series and obey the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit told me 
And if you don't know the Holy Spirit, that's like God's helper. The Holy Spirit put a word in my heart to show you that God has heard you. So the purpose of this entire message is for you to know that God has heard you. It's for you to know that, that even though you don't think anyone is listening or hears your heart or hears the pain that you're going through or hears about your situation and the struggles that you're up against, I just want you to know that God is saying to you today that God has heard you. And so we're going to talk about that. And we're going to use Job and, and Paul to unpack that. Before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about some psychology, a little bit about some science. And, and I want to introduce you to a doctor. It's, it's a guy named Abraham Maslow. And Abraham Maslow created this thing. It started as, as a paper and then it went into some research. And, and it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And if you're um, a psychology student or a therapist or you're in this field, then you'll know exactly what this is. This is not a difficult concept, but, but what Maslow kind of said is that there's a, a hierarchy to our needs, is that we have kind of these different levels of needs. And in fact, he kind of emphasized that human decision making is undergirded, it's, it's underpinned by a hierarchy of five core physical or physiological needs. So we have five areas that impact our needs. Now, when I talk about needs, again, I talk about what is it in your life that you're needing? You need more money to come in. You need, uh, you, know, you need somebody to be healed. You need out of the hospital. You need out of debt. You need a family member to come around. You need a marriage to be fixed. You need a miracle in a hopeless situation. There's all of those needs. But before we even get to those needs... Maslow is talking about these other five needs, and, and, and he creates a pyramid, and this pyramid happens for a reason. So, so at, at the bottom of this pyramid, it may be hard for, for some of you to see, but you have, the, you have what he calls the physiological needs. So these are just your basic needs. This is just basic life. If you don't have air, you will eventually have no more needs because you will eventually be gone, right? If you don't have water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, uh, the ability to reproduce, th th these, are, these are your basic needs. And, and what, what Maslow is saying is that with, with this hierarchy here, if you can't meet these physiological needs, these basic needs, then you can't move up in the pyramid. I, I'm glad ESCOM's not on here. Because <laughs> we'd all just be stuck down here at the bottom. But then if you meet these needs, let's say you have your air, your food, your water, your shelter, you've got all of that stuff, then you move up to safety. And safety is, is, is feeling your, your personal security. It, it's the, 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 the fact that you feel safe and secure in your environment, safe and secure in your home, that, that you can freely kind of travel and move around in your environment, and you feel like there's some safety there, that you've got property and you've got resources and there's health resources for you, access to medicine, but in general, life is feeling pretty safe. And, and, and there's always, you know, South Africa has a different context to America of what that looks like. When we have people from the States came over, they're always amazed at the walls and the, you know, the, the electric fencing and the wires and all of that stuff. And, and so safety is contextual, you know, here, it's, it's, you see something different with where people live, but in the States, you can't even go to school and feel safe right now. And that, that's, a, that's a tragedy. It's an absolute tragedy. So, so the, these two bottom ones here, you've got your basic needs, your basic sense of safety, and then you move on to love and belonging. The, the, this is a, a need for friendship, intimacy, a need for family, even a sense of connection, like a sense of connection with, with other groups of people. A connection into clubs, like a, a connection into a certain ministry or, or into, um, you know, so like a, even just like a, a group of guys getting together to ride a bike. I, like that, that, that even falls under this love and belonging. And so if, if you've hit your physiological needs, if you've hit your safety needs, if you've touched on and you've got love and belonging in your life, then... Maslow says, okay, now that you have those three bottom tier, those three basic needs, now we can move up. 
And we can move up into something that's, that's really important. And, and if you don't have these bottom ones covered, then you can't move up into the next one. And, and that is, is esteem. And, and esteem is respect. It's your self-esteem. It's status. It's recognition, strength, freedom. Now, th- this is the one that I want to unpack just a little bit more for you because I think this is an area where a lot of us, if we have these other ones nailed before we move to the very top, Esteem, it, it gets us, and it gets us really good. Because, see, along with, res- with, with esteem, what, kind of what it's referring to is it's self-respect. It's believing that you are valuable and that you are deserving of dignity. That, that's, that's part of this here. It's you're valuable and you're deserving of dignity because you have respect for yourself. It's self-respect. You know, the, the other aspect of it is is that, that you have like a, an established self-worth. It, it's that you know who you are and you know who, uh, you know, you, you're, you're unshakable. It, it's, I know who I am. I'm confident in, in who I am. I have respect for myself. I have respect for who I am. And then, and then it even goes on and it breaks out into a couple different chains. And there's, there's these kind of two uh, areas where it's based on, and, and Josh will put this on the screen here. One of them is, you can go forward. One of them is that it's, it's based on, keep going there, right there. It's based on the respect and acknowledgement from others. So that, that's important for your esteem. It's like, I want to be respected and acknowledged from other people. And it's based on your own self-assessment, which translates to self-confidence and independence. So how many people struggle with believing in yourself or thinking the best about yourself? You know, that, that's almost all of us. We struggle with that. And, and in fact, that's why we're doing a series called The Power to Change is because we've been captive of that and we can't seem to get out of that and we can't seem to change the way that we feel about ourselves. And here, this hierarchy of needs is saying is, is that if you can't have these things. If you can't take care of these areas, then you're never going to move up into the other areas of the pyramid. And the, the last part is self-actualization, which is really the desire to become the most that one can be. This is when you feel like that you can, you can just be all that you can be, that nothing's in your way, that you can fully be who you are. And you can even explore, you can become, uh, you can set goals in athleticism or music. It, you can learn new habits. You can learn new trades. It's just, it, it's like now I'm at a place where I'm kind of living in this extra area of freedom. So, so here's your hierarchy of needs. Now, I know for a fact that there's people, even in this room, that don't have access to clean water. I know for a fact that there's people whose shelter is under threat. I know for a fact that there's people who don't have a safe place to sleep, are struggling even with reproduction, like uh, getting pregnant, bringing a child into the world. I know for a fact that a lot of people in this room have major safety and security uh, uh, needs and fears, and rightfully so. So before we even talk about whether or not you're loved or whether you're unloved, I think I could knock out probably 95% of the room just on these bottom two here. And and when when I've heard your needs and when I've seen the emails come through and when I heard the situations that, that you were in and then even the situations that I don't know about that you've brought in this morning, I thought to myself, well, how can I, how can anyone, this feels like this is where we should want to be. I want to be up here into this, I believe in myself and I have confidence in myself and I'm self-confident. But how am I ever going to get there? Because I don't even have safety. I don't even have uh, a car to drive. I don't have a way to work. I've lost my job. My health is down. Um, I don't even have clean water at home. You know, and there's some people that are really in that situation. And so when I look at this hierarchy of needs, I think, how do we move through this? How do we move up through this? And in order to do that, I want to first to put ourselves in the shoes of Job. You know, Job, like you guys rightfully guessed, Job is a guy who's been talked about in the Bible, you know, a million times over. Job is this guy that 
that, that we've pulled metaphors and metaphors and metaphors about. And, and, you know, he's a guy that represents all of this stuff about how God, you know, why would God let this happen to people? Why would all this, you know, a good thing happen to or a bad thing happen to a good person? You know, Job was, you know, covered in boy, you know, had all this stuff that happened to him. We kind of all know the story about Job. And before I tell you the rest of the story, I just want you to know that my, my intent is not to use, uh, it, it's not to convince you or to trick you or to motivate you to hold on to a Bible verse or hold on to something and walk out of here and say, no, this is fixed. This is taken care of. This is, problem is solved. Really what I want to do is I want to use some examples that we look at in Job and Paul, and I want it to, to sink into your heart or sink into your mind even, and you get an opportunity today, and then hopefully when you go home, it's, it's like what I want is for you that are really struggling to have one momentary moment of relief. You know, when I think about the, the time that I spent, you know, and I, I talked about it weeks ago, just, you know, looking at depression, anxiety, and suicide. And, and, and as I was praying to God, I would do anything for one moment of relief. God, I don't need my problem solved. I don't need a whole day to be good. Can I just have like the next six seconds where I just, where it's okay? And, and that's where I hope by the end of this message, you can, uh, you can accept that it's, you, you're, it's okay for you to be good even though your situation maybe hasn't changed. And so you've got Job. Now Job is, is, is walking through his life and everything is going well. He's, got, he's married, he's got lots of kids, he's got cattle, he's got animals, he's got land. He's well respected within his community. So Job is sorted. And then out of nowhere, God and Satan are kind of hanging out and talking and God's like, hey man, look at that guy down there. Look at Job. That guy loves me. That guy's pretty good. And he actually says here to, to Satan, we can look in Job 1.8. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered and reflected on my servant Job? He's like, have you, have you seen this guy? He's awesome. This guy loves me a bunch. And he says, for there is no one like him on earth. He's a blameless and upright man. One who fears God with reverence. And he abstains from and turns away from evil because he honors God. So God's bragging on Job a little bit. And of course, Satan's response is almost comical. Satan says, yeah, God, of, of course Job fears you. Of course he does. But it's because he's got everything that he wants in his life. See, when his life is full of blessing, he fears you. But I, I guarantee you, if you take away the blessing and his trust, then Job will turn to cursing you. And so, so Satan kind of calls God's bluff and then... And then God allowed everything to happen to Job. And then God allowed Job to lose his family. He allowed Job to lose his, uh, his reputation. He allowed Job to lose all of his property. He allowed Job to lose his, his body and his physical health. God allowed Job to be completely torn down. And that leaves us asking the question of why would God brag on somebody and say that, hey, they're good and they, they, they revere me and they love me and they honor me. And then turn around and let Satan strip and take everything away from Job just so that God can prove a point to Satan that Job would still love God. And, and that, that again brings up the question that always comes with the book of Job of why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? You know, and I don't have an answer for this. And in fact, in the book of Job, there's a verse where it actually says that God does not have to reveal why he allows bad things to happen to good people. And there doesn't have to be a reason necessarily why bad things happen to good people. But with Job, it, it did. And so what, what Job did about this is, is Job went to God. And, and as these afflictions were happening to God, Job... Job began to curse God. Job, Job finally broke down and he questioned God. And when Job questioned God, God went and got right back in his face and he said, Job, you don't have the right to question me because you don't understand the cosmos of everything that I've created. God is basically saying, you know, an, a, a finite portion of how this universe works and your role in it is an even smaller little portion and you're questioning me about all of this. Job, you don't understand. Nor is it my responsibility for you to understand. 
And Job asked God for relief. And I don't know if you can identify with this. You're cursing God. You're saying, why is this happening to me? And then you're saying, God, give me some relief. The last thing you want to hear is God to say, you don't understand everything that's going on and I don't have to explain it to you. The, the other last thing that you want to hear is, is you, when you ask God for a break and you ask God for help, you don't want to hear what God tells Job. And, and God tells Job, okay, you're asking me for help and a break, but actually really all I'm going to give you or all I want from you is your trust that I'm a sovereign God. You know, that goes back to Job feared God when he had the blessing, but it was really hard for Job to fear God when he had everything stripped away from him. And at the end of the book of Job, there's this conversation with each other between God and Job, and they kind of go at it a little bit, and God puts Job in his place. And, and, and we, we learn that out of that, Job, Job learned some pretty good lessons, and these are the lessons that, that we can take away from it. But the point is, is that I want you to hear this, is that if you're a Job right now, and I've heard that come out of the mouth of people this week, they've said, I'm in a Job season. If you're in a Job season, I'm, I'm going to tell you, A, you're blessed for it. And B, I want you to know that Job has already done all the complaining, all the, the bickering. He's already done all the struggling with God for you. And so what we get to do is, is we don't have to take the long road of learning all these hard lessons because Job has already done it for you. Job's already done this for you. We, we don't have to do that. And so now before we finish Job's story, let's jump to Paul. So what, what about the story of Paul? If we put our, our feet in Paul's shoes... You know, we, we had Job who represents one kind of version of, of a lot of us. We feel like we're in a Job season, like things are really difficult, you know, all that stuff. And, and then you've got this guy, Paul, and Paul kind of feels to me like he was on the other end of, of Job. So Paul, also very successful. He was very smart. He was one of the lead Pharisees. In fact, he was tasked with the, with the charge of going out and squashing out this thing called the way. And the way was the movement that was following what Christ taught. You know, spreading the gospel message, which Paul thought this is perverting the Jewish religion so much. We've got to go out. We've got to stamp it down and we've got to put an end to it. And so Paul has this experience. And while he's going down the road to Damascus, he encounters Jesus. And when he encounters the actual resurrected Jesus on the road, he's struck blind. And when he's struck blind, he's given instructions to go into a town. And it's there that he was healed. And then he was given this calling. And when Paul received his calling, God said, you're going to go and you're going to take Jesus to the people, the exact people that you were persecuting. You're going to take Jesus to them. And because of that calling, Paul then ended up being almost solely responsible for the spread of Christianity outside of, of the Jewish nation, out, out into the majority of the known world at the time. And in fact, the majority of your, old, uh, the majority of your New Testament is written by or influenced by Paul and his teachings and his letters. And so Paul, he has this amazing calling on his life. Everything's going great. He has this hard thing that happens to him, gets struck blind, has an encounter with Jesus. He receives this calling. You would think that if Jesus has called you and prepared you and asked you to do something, then why would so much bad happen to you when you do it? Jesus has called me to move to South Africa and be a missionary and to, and this is my life here, and, and to go and, and start and build a church and, and do all these things. And if Jesus has called me to do that, then why did I spend four years in, in extreme depression, suicidal, struggling even to just be alive? If Jesus has called you to, to open a business and take a step and, and to purchase a house or, or whatever it is that you feel like God has called you to do, whatever desire you feel like God has blessed, you've had a desire placed in your heart and you've said, okay, I want to do this. And you get together with your spouse and you say, let's go for it. And then it falls through or it gets hard. And you all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, did Jesus, I don't know that Jesus really, maybe he didn't call me to do that. 
You know, we, we had a missionary couple one time who was, we were going to onboard before we were with South Point and bring down to South Africa to work with us. And, and they were, you know, raising money and we helped them raise money and they had all this, you know, money raised to come down and, and get ready to do this. And, and this really interesting thing happened. And that was that it got hard. And when it got hard, even before they got here in the country, they had a, a call with Casey and I and they said, you know, God has called us in a different direction. We really feel like God's, you know, changed his mind. I don't, think, I don't think God does that. I think if God's called you, he's called you. If he's told you, he's told you. But we get to a place where as soon as we encounter something hard, we question it. Because how could something bad happen to me if I'm following my heart? How could something bad happen if I'm doing what God called me to do? How could something bad happen in my marriage if, if I married the right person, if I made the vows, if I did my part, how can this bad thing be happening? You see, we, we see that in Paul because Paul's calling always seemed to come with a beating. And Paul never, so it sets him apart, he never lost the drive for his calling. Never, ever. In fact, he got so serious about his calling that he decided that he would become all things to all people just so that he could win some to Christ. In 1 Corinthians 9 here, and I wanted to read more verses, but I, I, we just don't have time for it. But Paul says, I've become all things to all men so that I may by all means in every way save some by leading them to faith in Jesus Christ. This is a man that has been beaten, stoned, shipwrecked. He spent a day and a half floating around in the ocean. I won't even go scuba diving. And he spends a day and a half floating in the ocean. This same man that was beaten, 30, he, he was given 39 lashings five times. And, and you know what? Paul is a Jewish Roman citizen, which means it was illegal to beat him. And he, does, he goes through it five times. That same man that goes up against all of that, he finds himself in a place here where he says, I will be all things to all people so that just some or someone can come to know Christ. Paul was not going to let his purpose, his calling, be threatened by the reality of his circumstances. If God said to do it, then you do it. If God called you to it, you stay in it. If God sets your identity like he did with Job, he called Job a, a good man. All the stuff that then happened to Job, it didn't change that Job was good. And you know what? Even when Job fought back against God, the way that book ended... Is Job praising God. That, that's how it's going to end. So we can go on and let me give you another thing about Paul here. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, this is how intentional he was. See, see, it takes a certain mindset. It takes a certain mentality in order for you to push through the hard things that come at you in life. It, it does. It's not easy. It's really not easy. Casey and I have lived abroad now for over 10 years. There's a lot of situations where we would have loved to have gone back home and run back home to our families. A lot of hurt, a lot of pain, a lot of death, where we could have just would have loved to have gone. But God called us here, and we're here. And so God calls Paul to a mission, and so this is how Paul handles it. Paul says, therefore, I do not run without a definite goal. Paul knows his goal is to win the loss to Jesus. He says, I do not flail around like one beating the air. It, it's, he's talking about like shadow boxing. He's not that weird guy in the corner of the gym that's like, you know, boxing nothing. He, he's, he's saying, I, I'm not just out there do, pretending here. And he says, but like a boxer, I strictly discipline my body and I make it my slave. That's why I survived the beatings. That's why I survived the shipwrecks. That's why I survived the hunger. That's why I survived the starvation and the cold is because I take all the things that I feel in my body and I make it my slave and I make it a slave to the master who is God over my heart. God over my heart is the master and my body is a slave to God. God called me into this. God spoke me into this and I will not be removed from it. And see, Paul, he goes on even to say, so after I have preached the gospel to others, I myself will not somehow be disqualified as unfit for service. Paul's holding himself accountable. See, what, what, what happens here is Job and Paul, they end up flipping the pyramid upside down. See, we had this, we had this, this hierarchical 
pyramid of needs here, and, and Josh is going to put that on the screen for you, where, where you've got to, did Paul always have water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing? No. Did Job always have these things? No. Did Paul or Job always have safety? No, they did not. In fact, they had the exact opposite. Paul was, was imprisoned. Jo- Job was, uh, in one day, watched his family be taken from him. Did they both have love and belonging? No. Job's wife scorned him. His own wife scorned him. Paul, he had an entire church, the church of Corinth, the church that, that he built, the church that he loved so much that he, that he gave his, 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 just all of his effort and energy into. And then in walks a bunch of false prophets and they, they then charge the people of the church and they pay it so that they can teach them something different. And Paul's like, I came to you for free and gave you the free gift of grace. Maybe I'm the dummy. Maybe I should have charged you money. And then you would have believed and listened to me. See, Paul doesn't even have the love and belonging there. Even the, the, the esteem part. You know, Paul, I don't think Paul ever lost that. And I also, I don't, I don't think Job ever lost it either. Even this idea of, of I'm going to become all that I want to become was never lost on the two of them. See, what I want you to understand is that, is that you're not a slave to this pyramid. Yes, there are situations where this makes sense. I'm not disproving science here. But what I want to do is I want to encourage you that you don't have to be stuck in this prison here. You can do just like Paul and Job have done. Take your heart, take your situation, whether you identify with a Job season or whether you identify with with a calling like Paul where everything's coming against you, you're not stuck on this right here. And here's why. It's because Job and Paul's given identity is what defined their esteem. See, they were given an identity. Job was favored by God. Paul was called by God, his son. Paul and Job were given their identity, and that's what defined their their, their self-worth. Nothing could take their self-worth from them. That's why Job stood up to all of his friends when his friends kept saying to him over and over and over again, you need to, to, to uh, repent, you need to, to curse God, you need to change, you need to do all these things. And, and Job says, no, 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 I know my identity. I know I don't have to worry about my self-respect coming from you because my identity is in, is in God, it's in Christ, it's in my creator. Same with Paul. Paul all those days that Paul sat in a jail, just cold, beaten, hungry, tired. That dude never once questioned his identity. That dude never once questioned whether or not he was respectable. And then it's the same with your purpose. See, it's their purpose to find their self-actualization. They're, they're, when you've been given a purpose by God, you already are walking in the fullness of that purpose. God's given it to you. You know, and if you don't know what that is, then, then ask God for it. But, you know, to put it really simply, you know, our purpose is to love God and be loved by God. So if you're struggling with finding a purpose or you're struggling with something like that, hey, here's a really easy one. Just go f- love God and let God love you. That, that's a good purpose for you. You know, uh, one more thing I just want us to, to kind of, focus around here before we enter into a time of, of worship is, is there's this thing that happens in both Paul and Job. Things, they both lose things. They both have things that are taken from them. And, and you know, we, we have things in our life, you know, it's like if you're, let me use the example of a car. You've got a new car, you've got a new white BMW. Somebody, you know, hits it, puts a big scratch down the side of it. You know, that's, that's easy to get upset about. But let's say your wife's in that car and she gets hit and you get a call. And now you're in the hospital hoping that she pulls through. Now all of a sudden, the car doesn't matter. See, and, and in that, and it's, it's through Job, we see what we truly love and trust are never seen until we're tested by lost. And so in in taking away our true love and taking away our true trust and taking away our true love, trust is revealed. And the most valuable, satisfying, beneficial, longest lasting gifts that we receive, guess what? They end up coming through the experiences of our lost. 
And see, th- th- this is why I said that if you're in a Job situation, you're really blessed right now because if you feel like something's been taken from you or, or you feel as though that, that you've lost something, then that probably means that God wants to give you something or he probably wants to help you find something different. So, so don't look at your loss as something bad. Look at it as, okay, God, what is it that you're trying to give me? What is it that you're trying to show me? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna count my Job season as a blessing. God, take it all. Because whatever you take, you're gonna replace. And he does that with Job. He restores everything to Job at the end. And so he, he shows us through Job that, that we find out what's important when we lose everything. And then God refills us with what really is important. And then Paul Paul shows us that it's possible to live out a purpose-filled life no matter what hardships you face. Nothing can take your purpose and identity in Christ. And so my my hope, and and I'm going to close now and then we're going to get into a a little bit of a different kind of worship here, is, is my hope for you is that whether you're a Job or a Paul, whether everything is falling apart or whether you're doubting everything about your calling, that today, just for a moment you can feel free to be good. I'm not asking you to feel great. I'm not asking you to feel blessed. I'm not asking you to feel loved. I'm asking you in a, in a moment, for you to take a moment to let yourself feel free to be good. Let go of all the other stuff that you feel like is holding you back and feel free to be good. And I'm gonna give you a special opportunity to do that today. Well, we're going we're gonna to do a, a couple more songs. That's why we didn't do them in the beginning. And the first one I'm going to have you stay seated for. And, and it's a song that is, um, it's called Satisfied in You. And what it is, is it's the singing of Psalm 42. And in this, it's David lamenting the hurt, lamenting the fact that he feels like God is, has left him and God has lost him. And, and that, that where is God? And then he kind of comes around to the idea that, no, he is satisfied in God and God alone. This is, it's a deep song. It's a heavy song. And I want you to stay seated and the band's going to play. We're going to have the lyrics on the screen. I just want you to read as they sing. And I want you to think about, God, we can be satisfied in him. But this is the fun part for me, because this is the part where God just does the work in you. I'm done. Now God gets to do his part in you. And so while the band leads us in this song, God's going to speak to you. I declare it in Jesus' name. And then after that, Mandy will ask you guys to stand and we'll sing a song of worship. Maybe if we have time, we'll do two, but, but then we'll, we'll come together and we'll sing a song of worship and then I'll, I'll dismiss you. But here's your homework or here's what you're going to do. You're going to sit, you're going to listen. God's going to speak to you. Then you're going to stand and you're going to worship. And in that moment, let yourself feel free to be good.